Welcome to Miami Temple. We are so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. Our church is focused on and dedicated to building up healthy Christian families. My name is Christine. My assistants Brian and Sophie and I will share with you five things you need to know about Miami Temple. Over to you, Brian and Sophie. Thank you, Christine. My name is Brian. I am Sophie and we are here to tell you five things to remember about Miami Temple. Join us every Saturday at 11 a.m. for our online worship experience. We encourage you to tell your family, friends, and neighbors so they too will be blessed. Go to our website, miamitemple.org, Facebook Live, or our YouTube channel. We have Saturday Bible Studies classes for all ages. Our online kids' Sabbath school starts at 10 a.m. before our live stream worship service. In the afternoons, we have several classes on for the youths and adults. Visit our website for more details. Did you know that Miami Temple is a praying church? Email your prayer request and our prayer warriors will be praying for you. Also, join our, our prayer line every day at 6 a.m. except Sundays. We are able to continue spreading the gospel through our faithful tithes and offering. We thank you generously for supporting Miami Temple local church budget. Here are five ways to give. Thank you for listening to us. My name is Brian. And Sophie. And now back to Christine. Bye. Thank you, Brian and Sophie, and great job. It's important that we stay connected. Subscribe to our e-news and iNews through WhatsApp by emailing us your mobile number. And as a bonus, you will receive Pastor Lafitte's Just a Thought. And as always, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. For more information, visit our website. On behalf of Sophie, Brian, Andre, Ginger, and myself, we are reminding you to reach out to someone over the phone. God bless you all, and we will leave you now with God's promise. Welcome and happy Sabbath. We want to invite you to sing with us as we worship our incredible creator. You'll find the lyrics below on your screen.
Have you ever noticed that our lives are full of rituals? Think about it. Weddings, graduations, funerals, they all represent new stages or big changes in life. Likewise, baptism, family worship, or Sabbath public worship are crucial for spiritual growth. But is it right under normal circumstances to remain at home on Sabbath instead of going to church? According to the Bible, the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. This word in Hebrew is mikra, which means meetings or assemblies. It means that God expects us to meet with others, to have a weekly collective ritual on that day. We are also warned not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As good as technological and online experiences may be, we are warned not to stay at home, but to seek for public, non-virtual worship. Whenever conditions permit, remember, the Sabbath is a holy convocation. Think about all the things we're able to do together on Sabbath. We pray, talking to God. We study His Word, hearing from Him. We sing, praising Him. And we bring our tithes and offerings, recognizing Him as our provider. Even though all the tithe and the main portion of the offerings may be given electronically, it is still very important that each family member learn to worship God by bringing offerings in a public service as an act of worship. As you return your tithe and give your promise, take a moment to pray and strengthen your soul along with your brothers and sisters. Reflect on the near future when you will be communing with Christ himself in the clouds of heaven. May we put our desires last and God first.
Dear Florida Conference family, what a privilege it is for me to speak to you today in this uh, special occasion. Imagine more than 70,000 members uh, worshiping together with us. So thank you for being there. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your participation in this program. We have tried to give you our best. I knew the meaning of the word quarantine, at least in the context of isolating the sick to avoid contagion or contamination, but I don't remember having a clear understanding of what a pandemic meant. I mean, having the world shut down in the 21st century as a result of a flu a virus, it never, never crossed my mind. And you learn. You learn. You start learning quickly. And you start, uh, you, you begin to, to draw conclusions. And you learn how unstable this world is. Because we have learned how vulnerable we are, but we have also learned how strong we are. This pandemic has exposed many things, and it has taught us many things. We have learned important lessons like the church is not a building, that discussions like who participates on the platform, or the music we sing, or the clothes we wear, or the order of the liturgy have become irrelevant. We have been able to learn that for too long, for too long, maybe, maybe, maybe we have given peripheral topics the importance that they never had while we ignored or took for granted the solid platform on which the Christian church was founded. Love for each other the centrality of the gospel, the promise of the second coming. Oh, dear Church of God, we must take this opportunity to reset, to refocus, to grow spiritually. And we should not allow ourselves to continue being blinded by our own human understanding and traditions. For too long, for too long we have believed that we were rich, that we were clothed, that we were able to see. And the Bible is telling us that we have not realized that we have been poor, blind, and naked. We were proud of our traditions in the sense of concepts that could not and will not stand the test of time. And maybe we are conducting ourselves irresponsibly in regards to the mission that was entrusted to the church, to us. You see, it gets to the point where self-preservation is not preservation at all. When the mission is blurred by irrelevant discussions that produce needless behaviors, the mission becomes unrecognizable. 
when the movement is required to carry so much unnecessary weight in the form of self-righteousness and human tradition, the movement becomes a heavy burden. When we strangle ministry for reasons of gender, or when we avoid giving our youth responsibility and participation in our church because we believe that they don't have the experience and we don't know how to deal with a post modern mentality, mind, the church suffers. When the gospel is presented in a way that loses charm because it is shared in a way that creates fears and a distorted image of God, then we are harming what Jesus accomplished in the cross of Calvary. As Paul says in Galatians 2.21, Christ died for nothing. We needed this pause. We needed this window of time. Maybe, I submit to you today, maybe we needed our buildings closed for some time. Maybe we needed our social church routines to be quarantined. I know that what I'm saying is hard, but Times like this deserve our total transparency. And God has allowed it because this pandemic, and I believe this, this pandemic did not take God by surprise. So he has allowed the church to go through this. Because in my, in my mind, in my heart, I'm feeling that God is trying to tell us something. We needed this pause. We needed to quarantine our social church routines. So God will use these things that are happening in our world today, not only to fulfill the signs and judgments that were prophesied by Jesus himself, to judge the world, but God will also use this crisis to reorganize the faithful, to revive the mission, to reveal the truth, to reignite the church, to redefine the message, and to prepare the saints for the final act, the second coming of Jesus. So the question is, and this is the question that I have for you today, is the Adventist church in Florida ready to fulfill the mission that was entrusted to us? It's a simple question. To be or not to be? That is the question. Do we want to be? Are we ready to return to our congregations with a renewed spirit, a laser-focused mission? Are we ready to return to our congregations with the intention that nothing is more important than to finish the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we ready to reopen the doors of our facilities with a renewed mind and a transformed heart? Here is a charge that I have for you today. Theologians call it the manifesto of Jesus Christ the manifesto of the Christian church, the reason for our existence as the Seventh-day Adventist church, the reset button that I'm talking about, the reason for going back to our gatherings with a renewed spirit, you will find the manifesto, the statement in Luke 4, 16 through 19. There you find Jesus that went back to the town, Nazareth, where he was brought up. And the Bible says that on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place 
where it was written. And here is the manifesto of Jesus Christ, and this is the manifesto of the Christian church. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, Jesus said, reading from the prophet Isaiah, because he has anointed me. And here is the charge to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Let this be our manifesto too. Let this be the manifesto of God's church in Florida. Let us go back to the centrality of the gospel. Let us recommit ourselves to making Jesus the center of our lives and message. Let us ask the Lord to reveal His Son to us. Let us love Jesus like never before. Lift up Jesus, you that teach the people. Lift Him up in sermon, in son, in prayer. Let all your powers be redirected to pointing souls, confused, lost, to the Lamb of God. Lift him up, the recent Savior, and say to all who hear, Come to him who hath loved us and hath given himself for us. Let the science of salvation be the burden of every sermon, every Bible study. Let the science of salvation be the center of everything we preach and teach. In our churches, in our schools, everywhere, bring nothing into, the, into your preaching. Bring nothing into your preaching to supplement Christ. The wisdom and power of God hold forth the word of life, presenting Jesus as the hope of the penitent and the stronghold of every believer. Reveal the way of peace to the troubled and the hopeless and show forth the grace and completeness of the Savior in your life. Ellen G. White Road in letter 86. These are our themes. Christ crucified for our sins. Christ risen from the dead. Christ our intercessor before God. Christ coming again and closely connected to this is the office work of the Holy Spirit, the representative of Christ sent forth with divine power and gifts for men. And then she adds, the sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth, is the great truth, is the great truth around which all other truth cluster. Everything we preach, everything we teach, our doctrines, everything has to be presented through the cross of Calvary in order to be rightly understood and appreciated every truth in the word of god from genesis to revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of calvary i present before you she said the great grand monument of mercy and regeneration salvation and redemption the son of god uplifted on a cross this should be the foundation of every sermon, every discourse, every Bible study, everything we say, everything we teach, this should be the foundation of everything we do. In our churches, in our homes, in our schools, in our hospitals, in our lives, let this be our manifesto. Christ uplifted as the only solution to this world. Number two, let this also be part of our manifesto. The church of God in Florida will be known 
We need to be known as the people of the book. As the people of the book. Did you know that the Adventist Church was known to the world as the people of the book for many years at the beginning of our movement? Did you know that our founders are pioneers? They wanted our church to be founded on the principles of the Reformation. Do you believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church preaches sola fide, sola gratia, sola scriptura, solus Christus, soli deo gloria? This means by grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, Scripture alone, glory of God alone. That is the foundation of the message that we proclaim to the Lord, that we proclaim to the world. In councils and writers, Ellen G. White is saying, at the time of the end, don't miss one word, please. At the time of the end, God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard for all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. When God's people are at ease and satisfied with their present enlightenment, we may be sure that God will not favor them. It is His will that we should be ever moving forward to receive the increased and ever increasing light which is shining for them. There will be, in a letter to P. T. Megan in 1903, almost at the end of her ministry, she wrote, there will be a development of the understanding, for the truth is capable of constant expansion. She is saying that the church of God should not be frozen in time. She is saying that the interpretation of the truth and doctrines that should drive decision-making process in the church should not be frozen in time. She is saying that the church should move forward, understanding the times and the seasons. She is saying they, there will be a development of the understanding, for the truth is capable of constant expansion. And she wrote this in 1903, again at the end of her ministry. She is saying our exploration of truth is yet incomplete. Yet sometimes I believe that we tried very hard to live in the 19th century and we make decisions that don't reflect this recommendation. We have gathered up only a few rays of light. Let me read it again. There will be a development of the understanding for the truth is capable of constant expansion. Our exploration of truth is yet incomplete. We have gathered up only a few rays of light. Once again, we are reminded that the present attitude of the church is not pleasing to God. There has come in a self-confidence that has led us to believe that there's no need for more truth and greater light. As we move forward, trying to fulfill the mission of God, we are living at a time when Satan is at work on the right hand and on the left, before and behind us, and yet as people we are asleep. So here is my charge to you. Here is what I call 
part of our manifesto, as we reopen our churches, as we open our doors for our gatherings again. Let us, let us go back to our gatherings, to our churches with a renewed spirit, with a heart ready to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to go back to the Bible. The truth is capable of constant expansion. God will reveal greater light for His Word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We will manifest His purpose to every generation. God, God will manifest His purpose to every generation as we commit ourselves to drink from the living waters of the everlasting Word of God. The people of God will never be in darkness. The truth will always shine upon those who seek the continuing light emerging from the Word of God. This Word will become pertinent, relevant to our needs today. The Word of God will answer our questions. We are looking for answers in the wrong place. My plea to you today as we go back to our churches, as we reopen our doors, let us go back to being the people of the book. Let us go back to being the people that found the foundation of everything that we believe and every truth that we proclaim on the Word of God. His Word will be pertinent, relevant. That's the promise for our needs today. His message will continue to conquer the most unreasonable hearts of this postmodern era. His Word will transform the church of today the same way it has transformed the church of all times. Let us make Jesus the center of our life, faith, our message. Let us go back to the Bible. The Lord wants to reveal more truth. The Lord is willing, is eager to give us direction, purpose, to answer the questions, those questions that have us struggling today. And let us, this be also our manifesto. Number three, and final point that I want to share with you, we need to go back to the mission that made us people. We need to go back to the mission that made us people. Peter says it this way, but you are a chosen people, royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you will declare, here is the, here is the mission for God's church, that you may declare the praises of Him. Him is Jesus. Jesus, who called you out of the darkness, out of darkness into the wonderful light. Once you were not a people, 160 years ago, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was not a people. But now we are the people of God. You are now the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now, now, the Lord wants to give us Grace, mercy, forgiveness, reconciliation, purpose, direction, mission. We were not, we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. As we prepare to reopen the doors of our churches and start gatherings again, let us recommit to the mission that God gave this church 160 years ago we were not a people today the Adventist church is, has presence in every corner of the world God has made us his special possession because he gave us a specific mission and a specific message to be proclaimed 
as it was revealed by the first angel in Revelation 14, the mission, go to the world, to every nation, tribe, and language, and people, the message, and proclaim, proclaim, proclaim the eternal gospel, good news of salvation. Proclaim the eternal gospel. Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The hour has come, dear church. Dear church, hear my heart. The hour has come for the people of God to proclaim that God has opened the books and authority and glory and sovereign power and dominion was given to the Lamb. And the things we are experiencing, experiencing today are nothing but signs that point to the fulfillment of Jesus' promise. And this is true. This is the true spirit of Adventism. If you say that you are part of God's church, part of the Adventist church, then you wake up every day looking up saying, Is it today, Lord? Is it today? Is it today? Are you coming back today? Today, today, and always. Today, that was the answer of William Miller when he was asked to give another date. He said, today, today, and always today. That is the spirit of Adventism. That is the right spirit, the true spirit of Adventism. We live to see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. That is our identity. That is who we are. And that is our mission to be proclaimed to the world. Jesus is coming again. Yes. The Lord requires something from us. He made us people from a handful of visionary youth. He made them go through a great disappointment. He confronted them with unimaginable challenges. He sent them to conquer the world with nothing but His Word. And as a patient father, God molded us, molded us until we became His church. He made us His special possession because He gave us a pertinent, urgent message a message that is only proclaimed by this church because our emphasis is there. Jesus is coming again. That is the true spirit of Adventism. If you are a Seventh-day Adventist, this is what you believe. Jesus is coming again. And God gave us a crucial mission. Go proclaim it to the world. When we look at, the, at our 160 years of existence, when we meditate on the ways the Lord has been with us over the years, we have to say it with confidence, there is nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be afraid of. Pandemic, not today, not today. We're going to crush COVID-19. The church is called to shine in a world like this. In a world that is falling apart. In a world of crisis. We are here to shine for Jesus. There is nothing to be afraid of. If you know, if I know who we are. Who we are. And that is. If Jesus is the grand monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption, the Son of God uplifted in every aspect of your life, if the Word of God is a source of all truth and doctrine, and if the mission is clear in our minds, there is nothing to be afraid of. Nothing. So as we go back, 
in the future, in the near future, because we still don't know when we're going to open our churches. But we know that we're going to go back and we're going to open the doors of our buildings and we're going to resume our gatherings. And, and dear church, let us not pretend that nothing happened. Let us go back with a renewed spirit. Let us go back to our churches with our mission clear in our minds, with Jesus living in our hearts, with the Word of God, the Scripture, guiding every decision that we make. The principles are here. I want to conclude with a story that I read a long time ago, but I like it. It goes well with the sermon. Florence Chakwil. Florence Chadwick was the first woman to swim across the English Channel in both directions. On the morning of July 4th, 1952, she was 34 years old. She attempted to swim the 26 miles between Catalina Island, Catalina Island, and the California coastline. 26 miles. As she began, she was flanked by small uh, boats that washed for sharks and were prepared to help her if she got hurt or grew tired. About 15 hours into the experience swimming, a thick fog set in. Florence began to doubt her ability, and she told her mother, who was in one of the boats, that she didn't think she could make it. She swam for another hour before asking to be pulled out, unable to see the coastline due to the fog. As she sat in the boat, she found out that she had stopped swimming just one mile, one mile away from her destination. A few hours later, while warming her body with a blanket, Florence said to a reporter, Look, I don't want to make excuses, but if I had seen the coastline, if I had seen the coastline, I would have made it. I would have never given up. It wasn't the fatigue, nor the charts, neither the cold water that defeated her. It was the fog. She could not see. Two months later, Chatwick tried again. This time was different. The same thick fog set in, but she made it. This time she made it because she said that she kept a mental image of the shoreline in her mind while she swam. She kept, she kept a mental image of the coastline in her mind as she swam. Now I may be speaking to someone today that has been touched by the Holy Spirit and wants to say more than reopening the doors of our church, or church building, what I really need is to reopen the doors of my heart to the one that is knocking outside. Jesus is asking you, let me in. Open the door. Dear church, please, don't go back to church pretending that nothing happened. The Lord has given us this time because He wants us to reflect. 
He wants us to reconsider our spiritual journey. He wants us to recommit to Jesus. He wants the Word and the mission of God to be revealed in us because it was assigned to us to proclaim the second coming of Jesus. Go back to the book. May Jesus, the center of your life and message, and devote your time, resources, gifts, and energy to the mission that was given to the church, and the fog will vanish. Keep that mental image of the heavenly city in your mind and keep moving forward. God wants to reveal more truth to the church. God wants to do great things with his church, but we need to be able to keep our mission, our purpose, and that beautiful picture of the heavenly city in our minds. Yes, it is true. There are many challenges. Yes, it is true. We're living through a pandemic, something that none of us have gone through, and maybe the very old amongst us, they remember or there were children, maybe, back in 1917, 1918, when the world suffered the Spanish flu pandemic. But this is something new to us. And yes, I recognize that there are many challenges. Yes, the work is big. Yes, we have many limitations. Yes, there are days when the shoreline looks far away. But remember, remember, we may be but one mile, one mile away from our destination. Let us keep that mental image of our heavenly home and the church will be victorious. And I leave you with this charge from Ellen G. White. In her well-known writing, God's hand is upon the wheel. She says, fearful perils are before those who bear responsibilities and work in the cause of God. Perils the thought of which make me tremble. But the word comes. God is saying, my hand is upon the wheel and I will not allow men to control my work for these last days. Amen for that. I'm so happy that it's God's hand on the wheel. It is not mine. It's not yours. It is God's hand. My hand is turning the wheel, God says. And my providence will continue to work out the divine plans, regardless of human inventions. In the great closing work, we shall meet with perplexities that we do not know how to deal with. We do not know how to deal with, but let us not forget that the three powers of heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are working, that a divine hand is on the wheel, and that God will bring His purposes to pass. Dear Father, give us the strength, give us your love, give us purpose, Give us clarity of mind. Keep that mental picture of the second coming of Jesus in our minds so that we persevere in the call that you have made to your church and in the purpose that you have given to your church and in the message that you have given to your church and in the mission that you have given to all of us because we know Lord, that your second coming might be but one mile away. We might be but one mile away from our destination. Bless your church. Protect your church. Bless your people. Keep them safe and healthy. 
give us your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. to Miami Temple. We are so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. Our church is focused on and dedicated to building up healthy Christian families. My name is Christine. 
My assistants Brian and Sophie and I will share with you five things you need to know about Miami Temple. Over to you, Brian and Sophie. Thank you, Christine. My name is Brian. I am Sophie, and we are here to tell you five things to remember about Miami Temple. Join us every Saturday at 11 a.m. for our online worship experience. We encourage you to tell your family, friends, and neighbors so they too will be blessed. Go to our website, MiamiTemple.org, Facebook Live, or our YouTube channel. We have Saturday Bible Studies classes for all ages. Our online kids' Sabbath school starts at 10 a.m. before our live stream worship service. In the afternoons, we have several classes for the youths and adults. Visit our website for more details. Did you know that Miami Temple is a praying church? Email your prayer request and our prayer warriors will be praying for you. Also, join our, our prayer line every day at 6 a.m. except Sundays. We are able to continue spreading the gospel through our faithful tithes and offering. We thank you generously for supporting Miami Temple local church budget. Here are five ways to give. Thank you for listening to us. My name is Brian. And Sophie. And now back to Christine. Bye. Thank you, Brian and Sophie, and great job. It's important that we stay connected. Subscribe to our e-news and iNews through WhatsApp by emailing us your mobile number. And as a bonus, you will receive Pastor Lafitte's Just a Thought. And as always, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. For more information, visit our website. On behalf of Sophie, Brian, Andre, Ginger, and myself, we are reminding you to reach out to someone over the phone. God bless you all, and we will leave you now with God's promise.